All right, so this is Linux 102. Everyone in the right place? So this is supposed to be a fun, real light lecture, like not get too deep into the nitty gritty, but just kind of explain what different distributions there are and what you might use them for. So uh, first off, I have a disclaimer. Uh, my name is Kevin Berkland. I work here at BTC teaching in the computer networking program. And I also help organize the event. So I have to have this disclaimer. The, the views expressed here do not reflect those of BTC campus or staff or Linux Fest as a whole. Opinions are just that, opinions. Uh, meaning if you get upset with something that I say, don't blame BTC or Linux Fest, blame me. Uh, if you disagree with my opinions, feel free to talk to me after the lecture and explain why your favorite distribution should be in another category, but please don't interrupt because you think Hannah Montana Linux is the best distro. <laughs> oh, and uh, a, a, new, a new one on this page uh, this year is all questions must be questions. Uh, no, no raising your hand and then, and then having your own mini lecture inside the lecture. All right. <laughs> so, what is a distro? Well, a distro or a distribution of Linux is a combination of operating system packages that are decided on by a group of people that think that this is the way that you should really experience Linux. They think that this, they have a vision, they have an idea of how it should work, and they want you to experience that vision. So Windows has one distro. There's this distro. It's, you, I mean, you can get a little different if you go like Windows 7 versus Windows 10, but you're still gonna get something that looks vaguely the same, that pretty much what you can do to make it look different is change these squares to different colors and change the desktop background. That's, that's the one distro that Windows has. Mac, very similar, it has one distribution. There's one overall guiding philosophy for the entire operating system by, created either by Microsoft or Apple depending on which operating system you're using. So, one of the first things that we need to go over is OS versus desktop environment. The desktop environment in Linux is what makes the graphics look pretty, it's what makes it look the way it looks. Operating system, on the other hand, is the underlying OS. And they're completely detached from each other, for the most part. Most distributions don't make a distinction between their OS and a given desktop environment. There's a couple that do, uh, like uh, Ubuntu, technically like all of the different other ones like Kubuntu and Edge Ubuntu and Exubuntu and all the other ones, they're kind of managed by other people. Ubuntu is just the one that they focus on, but for pretty much any operating system you can, you can have the same things. So, this is a picture of OpenSUSE. It is running KDE, uh, which is a desktop environment, and this is what it looks like. This is also OpenSUSE. This is OpenSUSE running GNOME. It's, uh, oh, and we'll get into it later, but it's technically pronounced GNOME, but I'm not gonna do that because I don't play those games. <laughs> so, these two, though they may look very different with, you know, start bar down at the bottom versus activities, panel, and side stuff, they are the same underlying OS. They, they look different underneath, at their core, they are the exact same thing. So, uh, I'm using the word popular here very loosely um, due to one thing on this list. Uh, but different popular desktop environments. So we got GNOME, KDE, Unity, Mate, Cinnamon, XFCE, and LXDE. And I'm going to go through and show you what each one of these looks like, just so that we can get the, uh, the prettiness out of the way and we can start talking about what makes the actual distros different. All right, so first up, we have GNOME, or GNOME. This is what it looks like when you're just on your desktop. The previous photo was when you were in the Applications Manager thing. But GNOME is a pretty interesting looking distribution. Uh, it's very modular. It works off of plugins. So if you don't like the fact that there's a bar at the top, all you have to do is go online, find a plugin, and the bar can be moved to the bottom or to the side. 
or you can get a dock down here. But in its default state, you have information at the top. Applications get launched in the middle here. You can have icons on the desktop. And if you drag your mouse into the upper right corner, it will display information about what's currently running and allow you to launch other programs. It's a pretty simple and clean uh, desktop environment. All right. This is KDE. KDE is <coughs> one of the like big precursor desktop environments. Oh man, it's cutting off my layers over here. But it's really interesting what they've done with it. It's uh, it's very modular. You can pretty much do anything you want with KDE, um, and it's really cool because. It's, if you're moving from a Windows type environment over to it, it provides a very similar feel. You got your start bar, you have desktop icons, you have programs that launch down at the bottom, you got your little widget drawer. Um, by the way, anyone here know what KDE stands for? Or at least what it stood for originally? The K desktop environment. No, it was the cool desktop environment. <laughs> with, with cool spelled. GNU Network Object Model Environment. Yeah. I, I just, uh, so the one thing I will say about KDE that might make it a little bit different if you choose this as your first uh, desktop environment to get into is it has a real bad case of Mortal Kombat Syndrome where everything has to start with a K. They, they renamed the terminal to console. Their web browser is not Firefox or uh, Chrome, but instead it is Conqueror, spelled with a K. Like, bad case of Mortal Kombat Syndrome. All right, so uh, this is Unity. And I had a real hard time deciding whether or not to include this in this year's slide deck. Uh, this is the default desktop manager for the Ubuntu operating system. If you've ever installed Ubuntu or messed around with Ubuntu, you probably have seen this before. You got your bar on the side. It's kind of Mac-like because you got your, your dock over here. Uh, all of your uh, menus are hidden, uh, meaning that until you move your mouse up to the top, you can't see the file or the tools or the options. And once you move up to the top bar, they reveal themselves. Um, the reason why I had trouble deciding whether or not to include this is Ubuntu announced, I think two weeks ago, that there, it might have been a month, time has been moving real strange. Uh, that they're no longer going to be using this and instead are going to be using GNOME as their primary desktop uh, environment moving forward. So with that in mind, <laughs> good night, sweet prince. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was always kind of controversial. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the controversy, but one of the main things was these, this button right here, uh, you might notice it, it's Amazon's logo. Uh, by default, it built in some Amazon shopping into the operating system. So if you like search for something in your shade, which opens up and allows you to launch programs, it would try and sell you things because every time I type terminal, I really want to try and buy like a terminal mouse pad or something. <laughs> All right. So next up we have Mate. Uh, Mate actually uh, started as a response to the fact that GNOME drastically changed its look and feel, uh, God, I think five years ago, maybe six. Uh, it used to look very similar to this with two bars and an applications drop down and no hot corner that I'm always triggering when I don't want to. Um, but Mate was a response to this. They did. They took what they liked from GNOME 2, and they forked it into Mate. And that's one of the really cool things that you can do in the Linux operating system. Is you don't like the way something's going, you change it, you move it, and uh, you make your own. But that can lead to some duplication of efforts. This is Cinnamon. Cinnamon is also a fork of GNOME 2. That was created by uh, the Linux Mint people because they didn't like the fact that GNOME 2 was changing. Mate and Cinnamon were developed at the same time as each other for the same reason as each other for two different ideas about how it should be the same. 
So it's really cool that you can do this, but if they had both just like worked together on building something cool, then there might not be as much fragmentation in the ecosystem. So it's a double-edged sword. All right, so next up we have XFCE. XFCE is a really lightweight uh, desktop manager. It's very nice if you have an older computer. Uh, one of the weird things about this is people thought it was dead for quite a while, and then they just like released a new version out of nowhere, uh, and they were like, oh, people have apparently still been working on this. Uh, it hadn't released a new version for like five, six years, and then all of a sudden, just one day, like, hey, new version of XFCE. And it works great. Actually, this is what I use when I am working in an office. This is my primary uh, display manager because it just gets out of the way and lets me do my thing, and it doesn't waste a lot of system resources on prettiness. And then also in the same vein of something lightweight, uh, and especially if you really like that Windows XP feel with the shaded bar down here. <laughs> LXDE is another lightweight display manager. It's a really nice one. Uh, you have an older system, you just want to get it up and running. This is one that is a little bit prettier than XFCE, but still gets the same job done. All right, so the main takeaway is all of those can run on any distro. So that shouldn't be your primary reason for choosing a distro is how it looks, because you can, you can make it look however you want. Uh, and it's fairly simple with most of them. All right, so now that we got that out of the way. Well, oh. before you go on, so I guess it, I don't know what the word is. It's workspaces or something? Oh, yeah. So do all of these do workspaces? And They all do to a degree. They all do it slightly differently. Um, I can't think of a single one that doesn't do it if you look hard enough. Uh, I know Unity had turned off by default. Uh, in the more recent releases of Ubuntu, but Unity's gone now, so hopefully when they port over to GNOME, they'll keep the, uh, the workspaces going. For those of you that don't know, workspaces is something that allows you to change your desktop without changing monitors, so you can have four virtual desktops on your machine and move between them. It's something that Mac copied from uh, Linux and it's one of their big selling points. And now Windows actually has it too, but no one knows how to access it or use it, so it's kind of useless. <laughs> All right. So these are some questions that I ask myself when I'm trying to help somebody figure out what distro to choose. Uh, what am I using Linux for? Am I an end user? Do I need this for work? What's going on? How long does it need to last? What what how many times a year can I stand to reinstall my operating system or update my operating system without pulling my hair out? How much can I deal with change? Do I like things that change a lot or do I want something that's like very stable and very slow and I only get new updates when I'm ready for it? What kind of hardware am I running? This is a new one this year. Uh, I completely blanked on this, but yeah, a lot of people have older computers or low power computers. It's something that you have to take into consideration. Uh, the philosophy of freedom we'll get into because let's have everyone hate me this year. Uh, and then do I need it to do my job, which is for years that was the biggest thing for me in my choice of Linux. All right, so without further ado, these are my recommendations of Linux for people new to Linux. Uh, let's start out with OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So. Tumbleweed is a really interesting idea. The philosophy of the operating system is that it's a rolling release, meaning there is no version number. If you have OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, you are always at the latest version. Uh, it's the same sort of model that Microsoft moved to with Windows 10 and probably will move back from in, I'm guessing, two years. <laughs> What's up? I don't recommend it for new people. Well, OK. <laughs> But this is my talk. <laughs> I actually really like this for new people because if you don't like that whole, 
you having to upgrade in version numbers, this is the best out-of-box experience that I've found for keeping those version numbers out of your life. In Linux, there's a lot of, there are other rolling release models, but I think OpenSUSE has some of the best uh, bug checking, so you're least likely to run into an error where something is too new and it breaks your system. Now this, that being said, if you're going to use this, you need to be okay with change because you might wake up tomorrow and your desktop manager has updated and completely changed the way it looks. All right, moving on. Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. Um, LTS is long-term support, meaning that it's not going to go away on you anytime soon. 16.04 uh, is the most recent LTS of Ubuntu. Uh, and the reason I recommend it is not because I love Ubuntu or anything that it does, but because it is one of the most wholly Googleable Linux operating systems on the planet. So many people use it, so many people have had the exact same problem that you're having, that you just take the error, punch it into Google, and there will be support posts, there will be blog posts, there will be a hundred other people that have run into and debugged this exact same problem and have a step-by-step -step walkthrough for how to get through it. Uh, the LTS does have some pitfalls in that it is long-term, meaning it's not going to get all of the latest and greatest cool new features. Uh, this you can install and you can keep it running as your Linux operating system for six years. You don't have to update beyond like the, the security patches and stuff. You don't have to change version. All right. Next up, Linux Mint. Uh, Linux Mint is here because it has to be here, because it is the most easy to use new Linux operating system, I think, personally. But it's to almost its own detriment because it takes almost everything Linuxy out of Linux. Like, you don't really have to touch the command line. You don't have to know anything about it. So if you have somebody that's like new to learning computers, that's very used to a Windows type environment, or if that's you yourself, Linux Mint is a great place to start, but I recommend moving on from it once you feel comfortable. It's, it's a really cool operating system, but it's, there's, there's better stuff. And then this one's new this year, and I really struggled with whether or not I was going to add it, but I decided to because uh, Elementary OS, for those of you that don't know, is a operating system for Linux that is, instead of trying to be like, get stuff done focused, or we're going to do the best this thing, they're very design driven. They, they want to make the prettiest Linux operating system that they can. And this one is another one that kind of tries to take the Linux out of Linux to the point where the command line might not work for some of the things that you're trying to do with it. But if you do want a Linux distro that is very pretty and just gets out of the way, this one is a good choice to try out. Uh, it is very clean, very elegant, but there's not a whole lot that I can say about it because there isn't a whole lot of depth to it. All right, so those are my new people Linux recommendations. Question? Yes. So the print is not more the desktop environment? Not it is, but Pantheon is their desktop environment, and as far as I know, it's not been ported fully to any other Linux distro. So that's why, it, well, OK, <laughs> SUSE. <laughs> Yes, of course SUSE has it. But you don't have their team that is focusing on making their design decisions. But they no, but their design yeah. decisions do it first. Okay. Yeah. The, the fact that they wrote human interface guidelines before they wrote a line of code has dramatically changed their approach. Oh yeah, that's why it's, but we'll get into that after this. All right, so next up, my recommendations for Linux for work. This isn't, Linux to do servers, 
but this is if you want to run Linux and you can run Linux as your work desktop, these are my recommendations. So once again, I'm going to start out with OpenSUSE, mostly because I have meetings at the OpenSUSE headquarters like once a month and James has converted me. Uh, OpenSUSE Leap is like, uh, it, it's their alternative to Tumbleweed. This one has major versions. Uh, currently the major version is 42.2. Uh, this is designed for sysadmins and creators first. Uh, there's a lot of really cool tools that allow you to accomplish things that you would normally have to go into the command line and spend a lot of time configuring stuff that you can just do through the graphical user environment. Um, and a big part of that is YAST. YAST is really cool. Uh, I was able to join my OpenSUSE computer to the school's domain in about 10 seconds, uh, which joining a Linux machine to a Windows domain typically is somewhat of a nightmare. All right. so. I've talked enough about OpenSUSE, let's move on. All right, Fedora Workstation 25 has changed my mind about not liking Fedora. <laughs> I actually really like it now. Um, so the Workstation, uh, once they started splitting off, a while ago Fedora started splitting off and had a server and a Workstation release, uh, and they kind of moved from being a bleeding edge distro, which means that their stuff sometimes breaks to a leading edge, sort of like making sure it doesn't break first and then pushing it. And that has made Fedora much more stable and easy to use in a work environment. Now, the one downside to running Fedora is you do have to keep up to date on your version numbers. Uh, I missed a full version number between the last time I gave this presentation and now. So I was on Fedora Workstation 23 the last time I gave this lecture. Now it's on 25. So in that time, two new releases have come out. Uh, I really like it. It's, um, it's based off of Red Hat. So especially if your uh, office is running CentOS or Red Hat based servers, uh, it's just a nicer, like still in the same ecosystem uh, environment. Sorry, just one very yep. quickly. Red Hat is based on Fedora. Oh, right. yeah, sorry. Yes, correct. All right, so moving on. How often, oh, sorry. Yeah. How often does that one actually update? Uh, so it updates major versions twice a year, I believe every six months? Every six months. The support cycle, though, is um, basically 13 months. You can yeah. skip one major release. Time. Yeah. You only have to upgrade every 12 months. Outside. Yeah. All right, so Debian is another one that I would recommend. Uh, Debian is what Ubuntu is based on. Uh, it is one of the big precursor Linuxes. Uh, this is, it, it spawned a lot of children. And the fact that the children have gotten easier use has moved upstream to Debian, making it easier to use. Uh, it is a really nice, clean operating system. Uh, I run it as servers, I run it as a desktop, I really like it. Um, and since it's based off of apt, the, or since it, well, created apt, a lot of the resources that you can find to help out with Ubuntu also help you with Debian. And uh, Red Hat 7 is also on the list. Red Hat 7, I believe, is the latest version of Red Hat. I did not check before I made this slide. I don't think they've released 8 yet. Yeah, it's 7, yes. Yes. So uh, if your company has the money to buy you a desktop license for Red Hat, go with that. Uh, if, if they're willing to pay for support and all of that stuff, because nothing makes Linux easier to use and work than being able to call someone else when it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and this is a new section for this year. Uh, I got two recommendations for Linux for old computers. Uh, this is beyond just using LXDE or XFCE. This is some Linux systems that are designed to run on the smallest hard drives, the oldest computers, that sort of thing. So I'm going to start out with Puppy Linux. Yeah. 
Puppy Linux is a cool, really cool Linux distribution. Uh, it is what is called a live Linux distribution, meaning that your Linux operating system actually runs off of the CD that you place into the computer or a USB drive. And then you can plug in a USB drive and that will be your hard drive for the operating system. Uh, it is very small, it is very lightweight, and it just gets out of the way and lets you use Linux and lets you get stuff done. I personally always keep a disk of Puppy around in case uh, you know somebody's computer breaks, I have to get on and get the files off of it, and you know then reinstall their Windows system. So, Puppy is one of my favorites. So DSL or damn small Linux is 50 megs. Let me repeat that: 50 megabytes. The entire Linux distribution fits on one twentieth of a gigabyte. It is, it is amazingly small, it is lightweight, it gets the job done. If you have an old system that like has a one gig drive, let's say, DSL will make it seem like you have breathing room on that device. <laughs> All right, and now on to Linux that feels like work. <laughs> uh, and this is when the crowd usually turns on me. Um, <laughs> so these, these aren't really, they're, they're hobbyist Linux. They're Linux that I recommend if you are the type of person that likes to throw yourself into the deep end of the pool as your way of learning how to swim. Um, it will be painful getting it set up, especially if it's your first Linux. But when you get out the other end, if you get out the other end, <laughs> you will know way more about how to set it up. So the first one is probably the easiest of all of them that I'm going to talk about. That's Arch Linux. Arch Linux, uh, once you get it installed, is pretty easy to use and nice. <laughs> getting it installed is the harder part because instead of like having an easy installer like I don't know any other modern Linux distribution uh, you you have a wiki page and an ISO that mounts itself as uh, onto a virtual machine and then you have to copy the files to the proper locations on the hard drive yourself it's really neat once you get it up and running it's cool and there's a lot of like repackages of arch that are actually easier to install and you can you know mess around with them for years the game den actually here ran on a live disc of arch that just had a bunch of games installed on it and it worked great but it's it's a little complicated uh it's a little bit tricky but if you like a little bit of a challenge i would really recommend it so next up, uh, Gen2 Linux. Uh, Gen2 actually became a bit of a joke on the internet for a while, uh, that people were having trouble with their computers. You'd, you'd say, oh man, my, my Windows 7 or my Windows XP machine is running slow. What should I do to fix it? And invariably, somebody would respond, install Gen2. That's because installing Gen2 is a process in pain and frustration. Uh, you, you get a bare minimum system and you get to choose everything that you want on that system. Uh, you, you pretty much have to pick each individual part of the system that you want. Uh, but it can make for a really fantastic user interface and environment and experience. And if you don't believe me, uh, this is a Chromebook. Chrome OS is based on Gen 2. It's, it, it's one of the easiest, like most people don't even realize that it's Linux that are using it. And it's based off of this kind of nightmarishly difficult to get into Linux. But it does get harder than that, don't worry. <laughs> Linux from scratch. Linux from scratch isn't so much of an operating system as it is a book. You, you, you purchase a book and it walks you through everything from compiling your own kernel to having your own Linux operating system. Uh, what's up? So isn't that basically the, just Gen 2 with book? Yes, it's Gen 2 with book. <laughs> well, I mean, book is harder than control effable 
wiki page, so I'm going to give the nod to Linux from scratch for harder. But Linux from scratch is super interesting. One, I keep on telling myself every summer that I'm going to start like messing around with it and try it. Every year I, I look at the book and I'm like, not this year. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> I had not noticed that. Thank you. That, that makes me happy. <laughs> All right. So this one, most of the people here, I'm guessing, aren't going to really use these servers slides, but I figure, you know, maybe you're a hobbyist, maybe you're getting into like building your own web server, so I should talk about servers for a little bit. Uh, and these are my personal recommendations for server operating systems. Uh, I really should have added a slide for Fedora as well, because Fedora server is actually really cool, but I forgot to add the slide this morning. All right, so CentOS and Red Hat again. Uh, CentOS is a free version of Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat is free as in free dumb, but it costs a license. You have to pay to license it. CentOS uh, started out as an independent fork where you could install and get a free version of uh, Red Hat running. And then Red Hat's like, oh, that's really cool. And then they bought CentOS, and now they're like in lockstep with each other. It's really nice that you can use CentOS as your dev environment and then push it to a Red Hat production environment. You don't have to pay for servers. Uh, that being said, personally, due to some bad experiences, I never want to use CentOS again. But it, it works really well. The next one that I'm going to recommend is Ubuntu LTS. Uh, the reason why I recommend this for servers is because for some reason this is the distro that is chosen by every Silicon Valley like startup to be what they run their cloud servers on. So if you're doing stuff directly with the cloud and you're not familiar with Linux like I was when I first started working, I got thrown into a startup and that was my first job in Linux. I ended up as lead head system admin when I hadn't even taken the Linux classes at this college yet. Ubuntu pretty much saved my bacon because I could Google everything. Uh, and that's what I did for two years, is just frantically and panically Google what was going wrong. And, and that guy knows because we worked together. And it was an interesting time of my life. The phone would go off at 2 AM, and I'd be like, why? Why me? Uh, and then SLEZ. Uh, SUSE Enterprise Linux is really cool. Uh, if it, it's another one that you have to have the license for, but if you can afford the license or the, the subscription, but if you can afford it, that's great. If you can't afford it and still want to run something similar, Leap makes a great server. We're actually running a Leap server here at the school. Uh, it hosts our inventory for the CNET program. All right. If I hadn't lost you before, I'm going to lose you now. Uh, let's talk about GNU slash Linux as a philosophy. Um, what's up? Are you going to cover distros anymore in the slides? I'm curious as to why Slackware wasn't mentioned as an ancestor. Oh, uh, so Slackware is an ancestor, but as a talk for people new to Linux, I don't really recommend Slackware. Well, I mean, I'm lying with Gen 2 or Linux from scratch. I think that's what's in with there. Okay. Yeah, I could I could add that in a later set. Okay. I'm sorry, yeah. Ancestor of what? What? Ancestor of which? Uh, well, it was ancestor of OpenSUSE, right? Yes. Yeah, all the SUSEs. Yeah, well, well, it came from the, I can't remember what it came from, but it's the oldest living distribution. Yeah. Right yeah, it's it's definitely interesting, but I hadn't thought of it, so that's why it's not in the deck. <laughs> What's up? As as a summary, uh, what would you say is the distro that better reflects like the vision of Linux, the spirit of Linux? That is a question that will get me lynched. <laughs> uh, it's Windows. No. Uh, pretty much, it's whatever one sounds most interesting to you. Uh, whatever one meshes with your own personal ideology or belief of what is cool about Linux, that's what you should use. 
Um, for me, and because that guy talks to me all the time, it, it's kind of it's, it's open SUSE. I, I really like it. Yeah, it's easier because if something goes wrong, I'm like, hey, what's wrong? Why is this not working? Uh, but for other people, it's whatever whatever you like using. All right, so let's let's move into GNU and Linux. So Linux often refers to the operating system, but Linux gets its name from the Linux kernel. The kernel is the translation layer between hardware and software. Um, if you want a slightly more in-depth talk on the Linux kernel, uh, my 101 lecture is already up on YouTube, and you can check that out. Um, GNU, on the other hand, is software that makes up more of Linux than the kernel is. Uh, it makes up typically 8 to 13 uh, percent. It stands for GNU not Unix, making it a recursive acronym and proving once again that nerds should never be allowed to name anything. <laughs> uh, it's free as in freedom, not free as in free beer. Um, so freedom versus free beer is a thing that you'll hear a lot if you stick around in the Linux community. Uh, and pretty much it comes down to the idea that you need to protect your freedom to use technology and share technology. And while most Linux distributions do a very good job of it, there's some that are considered far and away like they're, they're on the far end of the scale of this is what is considered free. Uh, and the, I, the word free has a slightly different definition as far as Linux community. Um, the general public license or GPL is what really is considered the gold standard of freedom. Uh, boiling it down to its bare gist, and I'm not going to get like this I will be yelled at on YouTube for this, I guarantee it. Uh, the idea is that if you take something that's licensed under the GPL and use it in your work, then you also have to re-release that under the GPL. You can modify it, you can take it, you can do whatever you want to it, but you also have to release it, and it becomes under the GPL. So it's kind of like the Borg. Uh, you will be assimilated if you use it in your, in your stuff. But that being said, then somebody else can see what you're doing and be like, that's really cool. I'm going to change something about it and re-release mine. And you could say, oh, wow, I never thought of that and roll that back into yours. And it allows the internet as we know it to function. So in a nod to uh, Richard Solomon, uh, the, the proponent and biggest fan of GNU, uh, this is a GNU Linux operating system. Uh, it's called Triskel. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it's actually what Richard Solomon is using right now uh, as his operating system. It's free in such a way as that it cannot have non-free software installed on it, at least not without some serious work, which I'm not here to, to make political statements, but that does restrict you somewhat. So it's not free as in I can do anything I want, but it's free as in I'm protecting freedom. So this is one of the things that makes Linux really cool. It's one of the things that is super awesome about Linux, is that anything you want to do with it, you can. You can take you know, parts from every different Linux distribution that you like, merge them all together, do everything that you want with it, and sometimes that leads to great things. And sometimes it leads to abominations. <laughs> if you guys thought I was joking about Ham on Tan Linux, I am not. And today is a sad day because Ham on Tan Linux officially cycled out. Uh, it's no longer supported because it was based on 12.04 LTS, which is, as of last month, no longer supported. So. Ham on Tan Linux. <laughs> if I thought ahead, I would also have this grayscale out, but. Uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the most beautiful and ugly things about Linux. You can take anything you want and make it a reality and release it and, or keep it for yourself. But it's there and you can do what you want. 
So I recommend that you do just that. Go out, start messing around with it. All the best people in life seem to like Linux. Steve Wozniak. Don't you want to be one of the best people? <laughs> so if you take away one thing from this lecture, there is no one right Linux distribution. Even if you really love one, even if you think it's great, it's going to be someone else's bane, someone else's nightmare. And someone is going to love the Linux operating system that you hate most. But that's fine and cool. And it's really awesome that we can all come together and have a fest of 2,000 people and talk about it. All right. So that's me. I'm Kevin Berkland. If you want to contact me, I'm over here. I'm turning it over for questions. <coughs> What's up? Uh, so Tails is an interesting one. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Tails was the Linux distribution that Edward Snowden used. Um, it has an interesting feature where you can click a button and it looks like Windows XP. Um, I think they might have updated that to 7. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge security buff. Like I, I like security. I'm, I'm all for securing my home and my technology, but I've never had the need to install or use Tails Linux. It's a, it's a specialty distro. Any other questions? Speaking of specialty distros, um, like for people that work specifically in Windows or Mac environments, I have any <coughs> recommendations for things for like troubleshooting and pen testing? Uh, oh, yeah. Trouble, troubleshoot. Uh, so pen testing, uh, Kali Linux is pretty much the gold standard of a penetration testing distro. Uh, the reason why it's not in my slide deck is I recommend no one use it unless you know what you're doing because if you click on the wrong things and start sending it out all willy-nilly then white vans are going to show up at your house and <laughs> you're going to have a talk with a, some three-letter acronym organization. <laughs> but He's if, joking, it may yeah, it, it, yeah d just if you have a legitimate need to pen test something, Kali Linux would be your, would be your use case. But make sure you know what you're doing and not just <coughs> clicking on things at random. Works, also... Yep, it, it is. It will. It will break into damn near anything. It's great. Uh, what's up? So a lot of people talk about different distributions in terms of their package managers. Yes. You can't read anything about Arch without that Pac-Man is awesome. Oh yeah. So uh, well, I mean, it's all. named Pac-Man. <laughs> so. Is there a better package manager as of last year? Uh, better package manager than Pac-Man? Uh, it, it's of any package manager. It's all up to what you want out of your Linux distribution. Once again, I, I really like Zipper because I don't like typing out the word install and I can just do in. Uh, and and that's really as as deep as I've delved into the delved into the package manager. But really, it's whatever you like best and whatever you're most used to. Um, I. I honestly don't talk much about package managers in this talk because for most users, package manager is not something that you're going to shift one way or another for. It's going to be more about the philosophy underlying the operating system. What's up? Elris Lynching mentioned that the Linux standard base yeah. actually defines RPM packages as the community standard. Oh yeah. RPM is the most cross-platform one, and there's a bunch of different there's a bunch of different installers that all use RPM. Like you can use RPM with Yum, DNF, uh, Zipper. What? You are I, that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, package management and all that stuff is still something that's it's kind of vague and weird in the Linux community, but. Uh, if you want something that's going to be most cross-platform, then try and go for something that uses .rpm instead of .deb or something else. What's that? Yes. In terms of uh, Linuxes that you don't pay a license for, yep. uh, what do you think is the best support, best supported? So, uh, and why? And why? So it's in, it depends on what you mean by supported. Like, uh, if you mean by the people that contribute their time and effort into it. Uh, for server type installations, I would recommend anyone that is based off of a one with a service contract. So, um, well, again. Like Red Hat or 
Red Hat? So, yeah, like CentOS or Fedora Server, uh, because Red Hat, you know, they, they have to make things work, otherwise that people stop giving them money. Uh, OpenSUSE, based off of SUSE, has to work, otherwise people stop giving them money. Uh, and Ubuntu ha does have a, uh, a service level agreement one. So if you don't like either of those better options, then Ubuntu also will work very well. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Um, if you want to switch to uh, just kind of immerse yourself into Linux a little bit more, you've been using you know, like a lifetime Windows user, but you have to use things like Word or PowerPoint or Excel, then what's, uh, are there Linux distributions that are compatible with those programs, and then what would be the best one? Nowadays, yes, because all of those have moved to the cloud. So if you have a web browser, you can use Office 365 if you absolutely have to. Although I do recommend checking out LibreOffice or OpenOffice as really solid alternatives. You can't do everything. There are some very like Windowsy things that they've made either design decisions to not do or they just don't have the funding to fully implement the feature. But for the standard user, 99% of the features are there. Cool. Yep. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, you said you, you might recommend Ubuntu just because it's easy to kind of Google yep. what might be going wrong. I was wondering what about Ubuntu uh, oh, uh, it's mostly the fact that Ubuntu has a design philosophy that is kind of at odds with the rest of Linux design philosophy. Um, the, the goal would be, for most distros, is to work on stuff and benefit the entire community as a whole. Ubuntu kind of likes to take its ball and go home. Uh, it's like, I don't like what you guys are doing, I'm going to do my own thing, and it's going to be better. And then they work on it, and they have unity for years, and then they're like, okay, you guys are right, we need no. Chris, this would be the easiest graphical installer. Uh, easiest graphical installer. Uh, I hate that I just, this is the follow-up to the previous one, but Ubuntu. Uh, it's the easiest graphical installer. I, I really like what uh, Fedora and Red Hat and CentOS have been doing with their installer recently, but it is not intuitive if you're coming from like an installing Windows to an installing that. Um, yeah. So I think that is pretty much my time. Um, yeah, you guys have a good day. Linux, Steam OS, it was inspired by, you know, the Windows.